Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. In the studio waiting to be profiled is author Noritza Matosian and jeweler Cynthia Bach. Writer broadcaster Noritza Matosian was born in Cyprus and educated in England. She's visiting Los Angeles from her home in London, where among other things, she's written two biographies about two influential and very interesting men. Yanis Zanakis, a composer, and the black angel, Arshel Gorky, a painter. Which, um, artist, yes. <laughs> should we call them both artists, Why not? Um, was more interesting to you? Oh, you can't ask me that <laughs> question, Joan. It's like saying, which of your two husbands did you love the most? Exactly. Tell us about Yanis. I met uh, Yanis Xenakis when I was still a student of um, philosophy. And the first thing that happened was I spoke to him in Greek. And you know, we were friends from that moment on, because he said, how come an Armenian speaks such good Greek? And uh, it was very instantaneous. I said to him, I'm just a student of philosophy. I want to write a book on you. I'm not a musicologist. And he said, so much the better. And he practically opened his studio to me there and then, gave me the key later on, and I used to just go and do my research. Tell us a little bit about what he did and why he was so important as a composer. Is he from Greece or was he He was from born in Greece and he actually t had a terrible accident. He was a partisan uh, during the war. And um, when the British came to liberate Athens, a mortar exploded in his oh. face and he lost an eye. And he was only 21 at the time. Then he uh, was condemned to death and he escaped with a false passport to Paris, where he became uh, an engineer in Le Corbusier's studio, the great, great architect. Oh, he, was. he worked as an engineer for Le Corbusier and then started doing um, designs of actual buildings for him. Meantime, he was working away at composing and he found the courage to actually leave the studio and to start composing on his own. And the thing about Xenakis is that he introduced mathematics and statistical mathematics and computers into music for the first time and his music is absolutely extraordinary. You uh, studied theater and mime in Paris, and you're a critic, and you wrote this book about a composer. Did you study music? Are you mu a uh, musical I, person? Yes, I, I've always played music and I studied music, but I was particularly interested in new music at that time. Oh. So I studied it and, and um, analyzed his pieces. His music was Totally contemporary, is Completely. that right? Still probably some of the most avant-garde music that exists today is, is his. And I think he is one of the great composers of the 20th century, and he's still alive, of course. I remember seeing him in New York a few years ago, and um, he was doing an interview, and we didn't know who he was. He's a very attractive man. Yes, yes. And we said, who's that man? And they said his name. Of course, we didn't know. But then I read later he was appearing, or his music was uh, being conducted by Zubin. Mater at the Avery Fisher Hall. I was there with him. It was my book launch was it? in America. <laughs> I yes. didn't know yes. you then. Yes. <laughs> Did uh, Zanakis' biography then lead you to Gorky? No, in a way, it was a complete break. Gorky was a break for me. And it was a book that I had not wanted to write because I fell in love with his paintings and felt something very familiar. And yet, uh, the whole story of the genocide was so much part of my own childhood and my past. And that's not what I wanted to do at that moment. But this man haunted me, and the work haunted me. And the fact of his having committed suicide after producing the most beautiful, joyful paintings was, uh, was a question that I wanted to answer. Well, how did that genocide issue really come into it? How did you decide, how did you know Gorky was a, a child of the genocide? I researched it. I, I went see. to find his sister, Vartush, who lived in Chicago. 
and I wanted to know just what the details were because there was so much nonsense written about Gorky and, and repeated uh, in the books and people hadn't bothered to research him because they probably possibly didn't know Armenian and so when I went to Vartu she started telling me these first person stories of Gorky actually in the siege of Van, um, walking with his mother over this parched landscape and suddenly I realized how directly he had been involved in the whole struggle and it really was a miracle that he survived, that he and his sister survived. They, they were t um, teenagers they were, or younger? Yeah, he was 13 and she was 11 they when, were. Yeah, in 1915. <clears throat> and you talk about that in your book Black Angel, The Life of Arshil Gorky. Yes. So tell me then when he came to, to America. America. He came to America when he was 18. His mother had died of starvation in the great um, famine in Armenia and he and his sister survived. So they made their way to um, Boston. His father had already gone to America. He had relatives there. And he was determined from the outset to be a painter. There was no way he was going to be anything else. He'd always drawn as a little boy. And Gorky had this wonderful line in drawing and drew like a great master, almost from the beginning. Uh, he managed to get himself into the Boston School of Fine Art. Then he went on to New York. And this boy who had come from a sleepy backwater, you know, Lake Van in um, Western Armenia, Vasparagan, suddenly realized that the message was actually coming from Paris and from Europe. And he was telling his other friends, uh, artists, actually to look at Picasso, Cezanne, Miro, Matisse. He didn't want to have anything to do with regionalist painting, which was very much the thing in um, New York at the time. And he saw the way forward with such clarity that other people followed him. You researched London, Chicago, Boston, Paris as well. Did you yes. research in Paris? All but over America. All over America. Armenia. <laughs> and Armenia Present as well. day Turkey. I went to find his village. But, but you had to research a man who was dead when you were writing mm. the Zanakis book. Was you there. had a live person I there. Did. How, how, what were the differences in having to well, write something like that? It was wonderful with Xenakis because he trusted me and gave me his studio keys, which he didn't give his wife, by the way. <laughs> uh, but then he also hid his childhood because it was very painful. And it took a long time for him to open up. But I was so lucky because I was not forbidden anything. I was allowed to do anything I liked and was given free reign. And he told you he things. Told me, he just told me. He treated me like a daughter. Uh -huh. you know? But, but you didn't have, you had people on the outside of Gorky of telling Gorky, you things. Gorky, I had a lot of conflicts. The families were in conflict. They each had their own viewpoints and almost an agenda. And so they always contradicted each other. And I had to find out one segment of his life from one um, set of relatives, and then his wife would contradict them, and vice versa. But that's often the way with biography, you know. You just have to do your detective work. One of the great things, um, one of the great pictures I think everyone knows mm. is this picture from the Whitney. Yes. Uh, painted by Gorky. Tell us a little bit about it. Gorky was photographed once in Van with his mother when he was just eight years old. And it was the only picture that survived this horrendous move and uh, transfer to America. When he got to Boston, he asked his sister if he could borrow this one picture and sh she trembled and said this is all I have of my mother anyway of course he took it and he drew from it and he wanted to create a painting of his mother so I would like to read oh. a little bit about that may I yes please we'd okay. love to have this you is read the, it. the story of the two in fact he painted two um, of these and works. they're in one's in the Whitney one is in the Whitney and the other one is in Washington National oh. Gallery of Washington it's called Myrig, this chapter, which means mother in Armenian, as you know. Gorky's vast studio was dominated by a single large painting, which seemed to float like an altarpiece. More than any other work, this compelling masterpiece has come to symbolize Gorky's love for his mother, and by extension, his love for his country. In exhibition, it overshadows other paintings with its poignancy. A dark-haired boy stands next to a seated woman. Her pale oval face, a pallid moon, hangs above the rose and lavender pyramid of her apron and long skirt. 
the enlarged saintly eyes of the woman and the boy's startled gaze in dark eye sockets are haunting. Gorky had studied the sepia photograph which his mother had sent to his father, the one he had borrowed from his sister Akabi. It was the only image of his childhood and of his mother before Van burned and their world had fallen apart. Gorky drew from that photograph like a man possessed, using different media, different parts of the image, pencil, pen, ink, crayon, and pastel. He did fine single line drawings and bold ink sketches. He drew it so often, like a musician, he practiced for his virtuoso performance. The artist and his mother has been likened to Ingres for simplicity of line and smoothness. But all commentaries miss his central and most logical inspiration, the Virgin and the Saints in the Church of the Holy Cross at Achtamar, the island across which he lived in the village of Khorkom. His friend Saul Sherry, a more traditional painter, recalled, he scraped it and he scraped it and he scraped it. Then he'd hold it over the bathtub and wipe off with a damp rag all the excess dust and paint. That's how he got that wonderful surface. It's the only painting he ever did that way. And de Kooning said he watched in awe. The surface of that painting is like a mirror. Surface is like a metaphor in art, metaphysical. Confident of his expertise at last, he painted in answer to a strong inner need. His homage to his mother was bound to take on a sacred quality. He painted her and himself in the shades of the rose tufa of Achtamar. She is the lost homeland retrieved, the resplendent Armenian earth and stone. Vartush described to me, his sister Vartush, how Gorky warned her before letting her see it for the first time. He sat her down, facing the portrait in his church-like luminous studio, and he said, Vartush, dear, here's mother. I'm going to leave you alone with her. He shut the door. Oh, I was so shocked. Mother was alive in the room with me. I told her everything, and I wept, and I wept. It's so fabulous, the way you've described everything. And if, if you know, when you talk about Tufa, the rich rose uh, terracotta stone. color of the stone mm. and the warmth that it, it, it brings out. But one other thing, you, you mentioned de Kooning. Who were his circle of friends? He had quite uh, an impressive circle of Huge friends. Huge circles of friends, and some of, them they didn't, some of them didn't know one another. He was a great friend of Stuart Davis, who was an All abstract right. American painter, very well known, of John Graham who was a um, great expert on primitive right. art and cubism. And of course, de Kooning followed him like a shadow. De Kooning realized that Gorky had a lot to teach him, and he called him the chief. Mm. Um, he was friends with Noguchi, the sculptor. Right. And he came, actually, with Noguchi to San Francisco and visited California. And the painting, which is here at the um, Los Angeles Museum, um, is called Moave after the desert, which Gorky visited. Oh, the Mojave Desert, And he, right. he loved uh, visiting the Indians, the American Indians, in that area. I think it reminded him somehow of home, of the, of the, the adobe buildings and, and, and the sort of simplicity of The sandy of land of yes, Armenia, maybe. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's so great. And our time is just about up, but I just want you to give uh, our audience a rundown on the one woman show that you do because you've performed it at the Barbican Center, the Gramercy Arts um, in New York, Skirball mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, and all over the, the Cyprus. Yes. So just tell us what it is quickly it, before we have to It came about because I wanted to tell the story of Gorky rather than lecturing about him. And then I wanted to honor the four women who had given him his life. Uh, Faith, uh, his girlfriend who gave him love, and his wife who gave him children. And so I tell his story from the viewpoint of each of those women with 140 slides and music. And it really spans his life from birth to death. And I got very involved in each of these four women, and um, I'm doing it really all over the world in Edinburgh. And um, I hope to develop it.
I think it's great. And Naritza, thank you so much for being with us thank today. Thank you, Joan. It's been wonderful thank to see you. you again. Thank you. Don't go away. We'll be right back with jewelry designer Cynthia Bach. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with jewelry designer Cynthia Bach, who was born in Tokyo. I guess she was an Air Force brat, because with her father and her German mother traveled everywhere. Uh, you lived 13 years in Germany. Yes, I did. And that was really a very um, influential part of my life. I think my collection's very European-inspired, from all the uh, cathedrals and the architecture and the fabulous castles that I would wander through. So you were this, old enough to really experience well, the area. Well, I know area. my mother would drag us. I was there when I was five years old. Oh, but you did? Until, let's see, five to like seven. <coughs> and she would drag us places, I don't remember. And then we moved back when I was 13 through 19. So oh, that was oh. a very impressionable time. Very impressionable. Yeah. Um, did you always want to be a jeweler? Always. You did? <laughs> yes. Since I was a tiny little girl and got into my mother's jewelry box, and I remember oh, I used to get into so much trouble because I would get into her jewelry and kind of redesign it, and I'd take stones out and put earrings together differently, ah. and she'd come home and go, oh my god, what have you done to my jewelry? <laughs> so that was like my first experience with designing, which I think now my mother's very proud of me and glad that, you know, during you that time, that. yeah, <laughs> she can see where it was going, what direction it developed. Did, did you go to school then um, to study jewelry or mm -hmm. art or what was your basic uh, study? Well, I didn't really actually. Um, my my first experience with jewelry was in college, and I took jewelry 101. And I, I was working on my art degree. I studied art history and where was um, that? Jewelry um, 101. <laughs> well, that was in at the um, well first at Munich, Germany. Oh, you did. Yeah, I, I started um, college in Munich, Ger Germany, and then I finished my degree in Texas. Oh. Abilene. Abilene, Texas. Abilene. No one's heard of Abilene. Well, it's 200 miles west of Dallas. I know Abilene because you my do? husband's partner is Judge Ely, and isn't there a big street You're kidding. named? No. Yes. What's it I called? I can't believe it. Um, I it's, don't remember. I think it's called Ely Boulevard. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. After his father, and then I have another friend who's a composer, songwriter, Carol Hall. Yes, I know Carol Hall. Who lives in Abilene. <laughs> or lived Bar in. Well, no, she just bought a little, my friend the Perini's um, little farmhouse, and she goes back and forth from Abilene to New York. She called me, and I said, you bought that house because it's called Gower Gulch or something. <laughs> she says, here's my address. Uh, you should go Broken visit. Rock, Texas, <laughs> something like that. No, Buffalo Gap, Texas. You got it, yeah. Buffalo Gap. I my said, husband used to have a museum there. Is that right? Yeah, so you, he's from Abilene. Well, tell us what happened after uh, Abilene. Well, um, I, well, I finished my degree in Abilene, and I, I met my husband, Jim Matthews, in Abilene, he's a Texan, and he's this amazing, amazing craftsman jeweler. He started whittling wood when he was five years old, and and he um, actually hired me to work in his workshop and apprentice jewelry and just more oh. hands-on work. Oh. So I'm actually a jeweler as well as a designer. And um, we opened a store together, and we did a lot of custom design work. And then out of the blue, um, seven or eight years later, Van Cleef and Arpels called us. How they got our number in Abilene, I don't know. Of all the people <laughs> in the world, they called us in Abilene. And, and for a year, we didn't even know who it was. It was a headhunter. And they said, how would you like to work for this very prestigious company? And uh, my husband said, no, we, we have our own store. You know, we own our own business. And they said, well, we'll pay you anything you want. So he went, oh, OK. And he sent a resume. And after a year of negotiating, we sent designs and works and actual prototypes of wax carvings um, 
of jewelry, they flew us to New York and we found out it was Van Cleef and Arpels and we said yes. Oh, you did? We will, you know, this was really an honor because it would bring our work to another level. Right. You know, they're, they're just a very old, um, established classic jewelry house, one of the finest. So they moved us to LA. Oh, you came to LA to work for Van Beverly Cleef. Hills. They had oh. West Coast Manufacturing. Yes, I right yeah. in the same yeah, building. Upstairs. Yes. And then, I mean, after moving us out here three years later, they decided to close West Coast Manufacturing. Oh. So we thought, well, you know, here we are. Um, I had been working on my own designs, and I actually was studying crowns. Uh, throughout history, I did little paintings and little crown replicas. I'm going to hold this because that's one of my tiaras. I, I want to show this tiara. because this became um, your signature. Signature. The um, tiaras, the crowns, the scepters, the orbs, anything that a queen surrounds herself in. Is this a bracelet? It's a bracelet, but it's also been worn as a hair ornament. Selma Hayek um, wore a platinum diamond one. We have a picture of and, and to then, the White House dinner. To, oh, did she? Yeah. Do I have the picture yeah, with you me? Do. Oh, I do. Oh, let me show that too. She's so beautiful. Is it the same uh, piece? It's platinum, but it's the same size. But it's really very beautiful. So you can just put your bracelet on. Well, I thought and put it on your head or wear it on. Yeah, your head. for a contemporary princess of the you know of the 20th century, we're not going to wear the big tiaras. Um, oh, why not? Well, I mean, we can. <laughs> so I thought a bracelet would be more practical for the working woman who wants to be a princess at night. I have a, a book. There was a wonderful show that the Museum of Boston, Fi Fine Arts Museum in Boston, mm -hmm. put on uh, tiaras. Yeah. And it was absolutely magnificent. And this is the kind of tiara or crown, I would say, uh, that I would like to be wearing every day. And you should. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing about that exhibit was um, they, at the end of the show, they they showed what, sh um, was it Show May? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Show May. Show May was Show May the, had a wall they have an, at the end. Uh, incredible. In, Show May had a wall in their showroom in Paris. And you could go in and pick any one of these styles. And you could put them together, back and forth, whatever you wanted. These were made out of silver. Mm -hmm. And you would then pick the stones. And I think it was just absolutely fabulous. And it was so forward thinking of Boston to do that mm -hmm. show. And here you are, you're calling them crowns or tiaras. tiaras. What, is there a difference? Well, yeah, the crown, the imperial crown is, of course, a big, massive, head ornament that goes all the way around. The tiara generally is just the front part. Just that, just yeah, the... Yeah, and more delicate generally in nature. And the tiaras were more, wore, worn huh, more for um, parties and things like that, where the crowns in the European culture were used for ceremonial, um, mm. you know, like inaugural type. Do you see a trend to tiaras? I mean, women oh, are wearing absolutely. headbands a lot now, I know. Yeah, absolutely, tiaras are hot. But they're also classic and have been around for thousands of years and will never go out of style. You are wearing the most beautiful Burma ruby beads. Mm -hmm. are, is there any kind of color trend in stones or jewelry right now? or? Well, last year we were doing a lot of platinum and diamond. There was a big resurgence of platinum going back to the classics. Designers were really um, using platinum in a more wearable, creative way than the traditional jewelry. This year I'm seeing, you know, I did Kate Blanchett's jewelry for the, oh, um, I have that picture the Oscars, too, yeah. and I did all the Indian jewelry and the gold. She looked so fabulous. And so everyone took her picture. The Indian, is there yeah, a trend Yeah, very in ethnic. The big hoop earrings are in again, which is sort of the resurgence of the 70s. I think everything is so reciprocal you make in history. You make everything in the workshop, all yeah. handmade. It's all handmade. And, and I, I want to cover this because I think it's interesting. There are specific terms that you use in the workshop. For example, for grooves. 
Uh, yeah, that, that's called gadruning, which is an old French furniture technique. So it's like actually yeah. making a group uh -huh. and granulation. Which is the little <laughs> beading. We, I don't know if you can see my bracelet, but it's little tiny beads that are soldered on the surface of the metal. It's its own do, art you form. You just drop them on mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, a lot of my beads, I do a lot of jewelry in wax carving, which is similar to wood carving, and I do a lot of the bead work in the wax. Oh, I see. Then there's another, there's all different kinds of finishes. Mm -hmm. What are some of the finishes that you use? Well, there is a matte finish, which is um, a brushed gold that's very popular. I use a combination of high polish with matte because I think the matte is soft against the skin, very feminine, and then the high polish makes it sparkle. Um, there is a Florentine finish that's hand engraving. Uh -huh. I use a brocade. One of my finishes is called brocade, where I resemble lace over gold, and it's like rich brocade fabric. Do you etch that? Do you have to yeah, etch it? Yeah, I etch it, it in. Uh -huh. So engraving is another finish. Uh, you know, metal, it's a hard surface. It's not as forgiving as clay and other mediums like paint, but but there's just a lot of creativity you can do with metals. I mean, look at the jewelry. I'm going to just hold history. this. We don't have very much time, but just tell us a little bit about this necklace before we leave. This is gorgeous Those are color. Colombian emeralds. Uh, they are 300 carats of gorgeous Shh. Colombian emeralds. Just has, again, that kind of ethnic, just simple look. And then I'm going to hold up the cross, excuse me for going in front of the camera. That Tell is us what my this is. Uh, medieval inspired cross that was actually inspired from a pailleur set given to Princess Margarita during the medieval 16th century, and it's citrine, sapphires, and pearls. It's so beautiful. Do you see yourself going into any other fields? No, <laughs> never. I, I love jewelry so passionately. It's what I've always wanted to do, and I feel fortunate to work at something that I love to do. Well, we're so happy you came on Thank and told you. us a little bit about what goes on in the workshop. And now well, when people look at yeah, jewelry. I sell all my jewelry at Neiman Marcus. Yes, so was, after Van Cleef, it, I went to Neiman's, I, and I have my own collection. I meant to say that you have an exclusive at yes. Neiman Marcus, and you can go in and find those little crowns there, yes, can't you? Yes, throughout the country. <laughs> <laughs> so then Thank everyone's you. a princess. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you, being Joan. with Thank us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for watching our show today. And keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 40th floor, Los Angeles 917. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Mm -hmm.